There's a, there's a, in your generation of people, uh, I don't know why I said people, but it's like not your generation of dogs, but in your generation of people, uh, there's this like thing with y'all, and it's somewhat in my generation, but it's, it's like unbelievably thick in your generation where you think you, you have to live this epic life, right? This, this great, extraordinary life. You have to be the next famous missionary or whatever if you're into, you know, wanting to be uh, known for being a Christian. But you gotta, you got to be famous for some way, in some significant way. And so, you know what you see in the scriptures over and over again is this. The people that God uses the most are not extraordinary great people. The people that God uses the most are people that are just faithful and available. They're really actually really ordinary people, but they serve, they serve an extraordinary God. Um, and so listen to this. Listen to this. You don't have to, when you go back to your campus, and you go back to your fraternity or sporty house, you don't have to be this, this extraordinary, great, otherworldly Christian. You simply do what some of you guys did last night. You're just faithful. You just make yourself available to be used by God. And He'll use very ordinary people to lead people to an extraordinary God. And so don't put the pressure on yourself that you have to be, you know, um, Matt Chandler in your house. Or Andy Stanley in your house. Or Louis Giglio in your house. Or whoever it may be. And you have to be this amazing orator of the gospel. Um, just be faithful, love Jesus, and let Him use you. And watch what happens. And some of y'all saw that happen last night. I mean, really unbelievable. Three people came to faith last night. Two, two people and then one dude that maybe. That's all you real. Four, you can't even keep up. Yeah, it's like, yeah. It was like 25, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's 30 now. Yeah, every time you tell it, it'll get higher. Um, yeah, Isaac can really help you with that. If you can. <laughs> And in all seriousness, uh, that is probably led more people to Jesus in this room than any of us. So, uh, Matt, props to Isaac. We love you, Matt. All right, turn to Galatians 4. That's where we're going to be this morning. Galatians 4, we'll start in verse 1. Uh, let me pray as you turn there. Father, what an incredible way to start the morning with hearing about what you have been doing in the last 12 hours, really, um, through these students who have encounter the living God while they're here and experience your grace in ways that for many of them they've never experienced before. And, uh, Lord, I just pray and ask that as they go from here in a couple days that it wouldn't be something that they think can only happen in, in the context of Greek Summit in some spiritual high uh, type environment, but that they would realize that you can do through them uh, amazing things because you're an amazing God. And so I just pray that for every single student in this room, that they would catch this vision of what an amazing God you are, and that all you're asking for is faithful and available people to be used, and that you would use them tremendously. I pray that we would continue to hear stories over this next year as they go back to their campuses of, of life change um, because of what you're doing through them. So we pray for that. We also pray this morning that as we open your word yet again, that you bless it. You teach us, instruct us, and shape us into your image. And we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I want to tell you this morning about Doodle Dmitry Mikhailovich. Yes, yes, I did say Doodle. Um, they call him Dima for short. He would always refer to himself in the third person as Dima. Um, I'll never forget the first time I laid eyes on him. He uh, was in a cardiac recovery room in a hospital in Kiev, Ukraine, where he had just uh, undergone what would be the first of two open heart surgeries to correct a um, heart defect. Uh, he was born October 25th, 2002, in a hospital in Kiev, where his birth mother had given birth under a false name and under false information. And then left him abandoned in the hospital where he spent the first nine, of his, uh, nine months of his life in the abandonment ward of the hospital. So he didn't have a name. The, the hospital is actually who named him Doodle Dmitry Nikolaevich, which would be similar to like a John Jacob Smith here in the States. Just kind of common names that uh, you would give, almost like a John Doe. 
After nine months, he was moved to an orphanage in uh, Zhitomer, Ukraine, which is about an hour west of Kiev, where when I met him, uh, he had been living there for about two and a half years. Uh, he lived in one room, uh, not very big, white walls, no color, uh, and he stayed in that room with 23 other orphans his age for 23 hours out of the day. They got one hour outside a day, and that was his weather permit. He owned nothing, he had no clothes, nothing to his name, no family, no inheritance. He was an orphan. I tell you this story because Dima is my son, and his name is now Samuel Norris, Samuel Gibbs Norris. He now has a new inheritance. Everything that is mine is his. He's got a family. He has an identity, he has a new name, and a new home. Adoption is a beautiful thing. And adoption here on this earth is really in so many magnificent ways a direct reflection of what God has done with us. In fact, it's the very analogy that God uses numerous times in the New Testament to explain what he has done for us through the gospel, that he has adopted us and made us sons and daughters. Paul, the Apostle Paul, oftentimes uses this analogy of orphan, that we were orphans, that we uh, had no inheritance, we had nothing. He either uses that or slaves, that we were slaves. We'll look at the passage here in a minute where he uses that. And then he talks about how God, in his great grace, has delivered us from the bonds and the chains of slavery or from the hopelessness of orphanages, spiritually speaking, and delivered us into a new family, into the kingdom of God, into the family of God, where we are now the inheritors of all that is God's and sons and daughters of the King. You know, I love some of the songs that we sang, all three of the songs that we sang this morning, and one of the things that we kept singing over and over again was, about the chains are, my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And then in the other song that I love so much, How Can It Be? It's just, you break my chains. And uh, this is what God has done for us. You know, when you think about Samuel, when you, when you think about any orphan child, there was nothing that Samuel did to beckon us to him. We didn't know who he was. We, we went through the night, it was actually, ironically, a nine-month process when we first started the paperwork until the day that we were able to adopt him. We spent a month, we spent the month of October in 2005 in country for 31 days uh, doing all kinds of paperwork and paying off who we needed to pay off to get our son. But we didn't even know, we didn't even see a picture of him or know who we were getting until we got there in the orphanage. When we went to the orphanage, they showed us a picture in the hallway. And we go, oh, wow, okay. And so in other words, Samuel didn't send us a letter with pictures saying, please come adopt me. I really need a home. Samuel didn't understand that he was even an orphan. I mean, he's a young two-year-old uh, who doesn't understand life outside of, of an orphanage. And so to him, that was life. He didn't beckon us to him. He didn't woo us to him. Only because of our desire to change his reality. And only because we longed for a son did we rescue him. And so such a picture of the gospel. There was nothing that we did to woo God to us, to beckon him to us. We didn't send God a resume of our best works to say, God, this is why I deserve salvation. This is why you should rescue me. We didn't even know. We didn't understand. We didn't even know we were slaves or orphans. Yet God in his great grace moved towards us and came to us when we weren't even asking for it. And made us sons and daughters. What I want to look at this morning, there's several different places in the scriptures that we could go um, that would teach us about adoption and about being sons and daughters. Uh, but where I want to go is to Galatians 4. This is the passage that over the years, ever since we adopted Samuel, um, this is the passage that for me has been most significant. 
I want to, I want to give you this morning, you'll see on your sheets, I want to give you four blessings of adoption, glorious blessings of adoption. And there's more that I could give you, even in that. Uh, but I just want to give you the most significant four that come as a result of our adoption. I want to give you a disclaimer as well. Uh, it's important to remember that these four blessings that we're about to walk through that are just sig unbelievably significant and tremendous in understanding what's true of us now in Christ. Uh, the key word is in Christ. This is, these things are not true of those who don't follow Jesus. You know, one of the things that is commonly said that is really um, wrong and that we need to correct is you'll hear people, uh, you know, something bad happens in the news, uh, you know, uh, like the Amtrak thing that happens where people die or some type of terrorist attack or something. And you'll hear someone interviewed say something along the lines of, we're all God's children. You know, why would we treat each other this way? And here's the reality. We're all made in the image of God, but we're not all God's children. We're not God's children until we believe upon Jesus. And it's only at that point that we're transferred from being orphans. Remember what we talked about in Ephesians 2, where we're dead in the trespasses of our, sin, uh, trespasses of our sins. And we're transferred by God's grace through faith in Jesus to being children of God and alive in Christ. <laughs> And so, you know, these are things that you need to remember. This is only by the grace of God. And this is only uh, true of those who are in Christ. So let's read the passage and I'll give you some things to think about. Uh, chapter 4 of Galatians verse 1 says this. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the day set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. We'll come back to verses 8 through 11 later. Uh, four things I want to give you. The first one, if you look at verse, really verse 1, I want to explain this analogy first, and then we'll get to verse 5, where I want to give you um, specifically what, what you're filling the world blanks in on. But look at verse 1, where he starts with this analogy. He says, I mean that the, the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the day set by his father. So here's what Paul is doing. He's drawing a comparison. And his readers, these Galatian readers in the Roman Empire, would have fully understood, understood, understood uh, yeah, fully understood the, uh, the ramifications of what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. Uh, in that day and time, uh, really in many ways, not in every way, but in many ways, a child who is still uh, young and has not gotten to the age where he can, either his father passes away or to the age of 18 or 21 or whatever the age was that was set where they began to own things themselves. A child and a slave are really no different in this sense. A slave owned nothing and received nothing. And when you hear slave, by the way, don't think like American history slave, uh, like uh, when we would... Uh, enslaved Africans in the 1800s and 1700s. It was so horrible. Uh, Roman uh, in, you know, slavery, which was really more bond servanthood, was not fun or good, but it was much better than what we have often uh, remember as slavery here. So it was in, in the sense of where uh, you would serve a family for, the, for basically your whole entire life. And sometimes you would actually get adopted by that family, and I'll speak to that in a second. But you would serve this family, but even though you got to know this family well and you were and you are a bondservant to this family. You never owned anything. You never got an inheritance. And the child it was the same way until, until the date set by his father. And at a certain date, maybe 18, maybe 20, maybe 15, whatever it was, the father would say, okay, now you're old enough as the man, as my firstborn son, to receive an inheritance. And to transfer from being someone who owns nothing and inherits nothing to one who gets everything. And so Paul is drawing this analogy, and then look at verse 5, skipping ahead a little bit, where he says this. So he's saying now, the Father, God the Father, now, when the fullness of time had come, so that when the date was set by God, our Heavenly Father, 
So he says this, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. And then verse 5, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. So here's the first thing I want you to get. Our adoption in Christ gives us a new legal standing. A new legal standing. I mentioned justification yesterday. You've heard it a lot since you've been here. Uh, justification is a legal term that the Bible uses. It's a legal term. And the picture I want you to get is this. If you were to stand in a courtroom before a judge, and all the evidence against you clearly <coughs> makes you guilty. I mean, you're standing before this judge, and you are without question guilty. And as you're standing in the presence of this judge, guilty and ready to be condemned, and receive your sentence, at the last moment, at the proper time, at the appropriate moment, a substitute comes and stands between you and the judge and says, take what you were going to give to him, the condemnation you were about to pronounce on him and put it on me and let him go free. And so suddenly, even though you're guilty, even though everything on your record should condemn you, you, are, you have a new legal standing. You are sent free as though you were innocent. And this is a picture of justification of what God does with us. He gives us a new legal standing. We've been redeemed from the law and our slate has been wiped clean as a result of what Christ has done for us. And once this legal transaction had happened in the Roman law, so don't think of the law like biblical law. I'm now talking about the Roman law. Once this transaction had happened, this, this adoption transaction in the Roman world, it was irreversible and irrevocable. You couldn't change it. I'll explain a little bit more about that in our second point. But I want you to understand that our adoption in Christ gives us a new legal standing. We now stand before God, and what he sees when he looks at us is he sees innocent and pure and perfect and righteous, not because we are, but because Christ was in our place, or is in our place. And so you'll see your second blank underneath point one, and just to, if you want to keep up, this is the freedom that the gospel offers. This is the freedom that the gospel offers. We should be condemned. We were enslaved to sin. We have no right to stand before God. Certainly is a free person, but uh, even more, like how could we stand before God and uh, say that we're sons and daughters? Yet he pronounces us innocent and free and then adopts us as his own. Second point. Look at verses uh, 5 and 6 again. It says this. He did this, verse 5, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Verse 6. And because you were sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out the Father. Second thing I want you to get is this. Our adoption in Christ gives us a new family relationship. Our adoption in Christ gives us a new family relationship, and this is the intimacy that the gospel offers. This is the intimacy that the gospel offers. Notice that it's the spirit that drives the intimacy with God. Verse 6 again says, And because of your sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Father. So we talked a lot about even yesterday morning, about that when we believe upon Christ, the Spirit of God Himself comes and dwells within us. And when the Spirit is in us, He actually begins to warm our hearts towards God, not just as this God who gives us good things, but as our Father, our loving Father, who we are now uh, prone to, in a sense, crawl up in His lap and cry, Daddy. This word Abba is a hard word to translate for us into English. Uh, sometimes the, our best attempts are to translate it in, in, in a, the most practical senses, this intimate term, towards Father. So something like Daddy or Papa or something like that, where we're saying, yes, you're my Father who gives me good things, but you're also my intimate Dad in terms of that you love me more than I could ever understand or fathom. You know, I think about my kids right now. So Samuel, we, I, you know a little bit of his story, that we adopted him. Uh, brought him home right after his third birthday in November of 2005. 
Uh, God then in all of our children are miracles in a sense because we didn't think we were ever going to have children. And uh, God did some really cool things through modern medicine and then just surprised the heck out of us with our last one. But anyway, we ended up with three girls biologically. But uh, we have three boys and a girl. And with all four of my children, you know what I long for the most? I, there are certainly things that I want to be true of them. I want them to excel in school. I want them to excel in athletics or whatever it is that they're pursuing. But you know what I want more than anything is I want to hold them. I want to be near to them. I want to kiss them. I want to hug them. I want them to crawl up in my lap. One of my favorite things in the world is to come home at the end of the day and walk through the door and all four of my kids, and I hope this never changes, but I know that it will as they get older, but all four of my kids to this day, uh, as soon as I walk through the door, all I hear is daddy and running. Daddy and running. And they run to me and I grab them up in my arms and I just kiss them and I hug them. And one of my favorite things to do is to grab my kids, hold them in my arms, and whisper in their ear, I love you and you're mine. I love you and you're mine. I tell my daughters all the time, your daddy's princess. Nothing will ever change that. I tell Samuel all the time, your daddy's stud. You're the biggest stud I've ever met. And I love that because I, I am the, uh, a father who would towards his children. Now listen to what scripture says. There's a verse in the Gospel of John that says this, that it says, if you being evil know how to give good things to your children, how much more will your Father in Heaven, who is perfect, give you good things? So I want you to think about this. If me being evil, meaning that yes, I have the Spirit of God in me, but I'm still tainted by sin, and I'm still incredibly selfish, and I'm still uh, working and processing through this process of sanctification, meaning that I don't love my kids perfectly, far from it. But if me being evil, if that's the longing of my heart as a father, if that's what I want so desperately, more than anything else, more than their performance academically or athletically or whatever events that they're involved in or extracurricular activities, more than anything else, what I long for is to be with them and to hold them and to whisper in the ear, I love you, you are mine, and just adore them and dote all over them. If that's true of me, how much more? How much more of our Heavenly Father? You see, here's a problem that many of us have, and I don't want to, I don't want to just, some of you have an incredible earthly father, some of you have, have come from really tough situations with your dad. But for, for all of us, a lot of the times, our ability to draw near to our Heavenly Father is really connected in many ways to our ability of, uh, to draw near to our earthly father. How do we view our earthly dad? And if you have a strange, a strained relationship with your dad here on earth, then it's probably going to be a little bit more difficult for you to see God as Father in an intimate, loving way. You're going to see him more as a guy who hands out money when you need it. Some of you have a relationship with your dad where the only time you talk to him is when your bank account is getting low. You call him and say, hey, uh, can we get some more money? And uh, you'll be able to get some money from around this month. And that's, that's the extent of your relationship with him. If that's true of you, then you need to recognize that what's going to be hard for you with your Heavenly Father is to not see him in the same vein. To only see God as one who dishes things out when you need it. You know, you're, as Jay said last week at some point, you're your cosmic grandfather who just hands out spiritual candy whenever you're ready. And to not draw near to him and move close to him in a way that you just say, you know, I don't want things from you. I, I want you. I need you. I need to be in your presence. I think about when we first met Samuel in the orphanage. Um, you know, he was speaking Russian. And it was really hard to uh, communicate with him. And so we had to do a lot of just hand gestures and, you know, just trying to communicate in the way that we could. And we were learning a few key Russian words to be able to kind of communicate some things to him. But I'll, I'll always remember the first, you know, week, if not longer, or two weeks that we were in the orphanage that we would get to visit every day for two hours. And that was really actually a real ble a blessing because we got to go every day for a couple hours and he got more and more used to us. If we had just walked in and uh, taken him day one, he would have freaked out. And so we're the, we would go into this little playroom that they had in the orphanage, which, uh, again, an, another just grace of God thing, uh, the orphanages in Ukraine are pretty awful, but he actually was in one that was one of the more well-funded orphanages in the country. And so they had a really cool playroom, and, but in this playroom there were shelves that were really high, just stacks of toys on each shelf. 
and Samuel pretty much every day would walk over to these shelves and he, there was all these toys up here that he couldn't reach. But he saw me as some dude that's come to play with him who's tall who can reach him. And so he would constantly come to me, come to me, but not for anything about me, but for what I could give him. And so his relationship with me was not intimate in any way. It was not, hey, I want this big guy because I'm understanding that he's my dad and he's showing love to me in ways that I've never received it before, or ever been around before. It wasn't that. It was, there's a toy that I want and he can reach it. So he would come and tap my leg or even hug my leg and then just point. And so I would grab it and I, once he had the toy, he didn't want anything to do with me. And I thought, man, this is what we do. There's something that I want. I can't attain it, but God is God and He's powerful. So I don't really want God. I don't really want to crawl on His lap and cry out the Father and have this intimate relationship with Him. It really has nothing to do with God. God is the means to an end. That is my end. He can get it for me. And once I get it, then God is irrelevant to me. How many of you serve God as a means to an end rather than an end? See, the whole point of this thing is not what God can get you. The whole point of this thing is that you get God. And there's a major difference. We treat God like a genie in a bottle that we rub whenever we need help. And God says, I don't want that. That's not why I ransomed you. That's not why I made you my daughter or my son. I rescued you to have a relationship with you to pour out my love on you and to be in an intimate family relationship with you. And yet you treat me as though all I am to you is someone who fills your spiritual ATM. So I want you to think about the ways and be convicted and challenged in the ways in which you approach God, not as an end in and of himself, but a means to an end. Thirdly, Look at verse 7. Verse 7 says this, So you are no longer a slave. Hear that. You are no longer a slave to sin, but a son. And when you hear son, ladies, understand that in the, in the Greek world, the Roman world that this was being written in, when Paul addresses sons, he's, it's the implication, and you'll often have... Um, footnotes in your Bible that will say this is implying sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. So you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son then an heir. you gotta, you got to remember this guys, you and I were enemies of God. We weren't just like you know, people that had slightly offended God. We were enemies of God. We were ISIS to God. Right? We were, we were, we were, I don't know what to say other than what is more strong than enemies. We had spat in the face of God. We had uh, flipped the bird at God. We had done everything that is not appropriate to God as a result of our sin. And God transferred us from being enemies to being sons who crawl up in his lap and cry, Abba, Father, and declare him to be our intimate, loving Father who has bestowed upon us every blessing in this universe, spiritually speaking. It's crazy when you start to think about it. Verse 7 reminds us that we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness and slavery and condemnation to the kingdom of light and love and acceptance. Many of us think that God has... What he's done for us is this. Uh, this is how we view the gospel many times. Is that we think God has, yes, he's come into our orphan state. And yes, he's rescued us. And yes, he's brought us into a new home. But he is the, just the dad that doesn't really like us and he just tolerates us. He's the dad who's present. He's the father who's present but doesn't really love his kids. Doesn't engage with them emotionally in any way. He's just the, he's the absent father. So some of us think of God as a God who forgives and tolerates, but here's the reality. He doesn't just forgive, and he cer certainly doesn't tolerate us. He's, he's this. He declares us righteous and adores us. He absolutely 
loves you in ways that you could have. You'll spend the rest of your life and honestly the rest of eternity mining the depths of his love for you. Think about that. You will spend the rest of your life and the rest of eternity mining the depths of his love for you. I mentioned that an adopted son, the third thing, I, I forgot to give you the blank here, the third thing is our adoption in Christ, according to verse 7, is that we have a new inheritance. It gives us a new inheritance. And the Spirit is our security. We talked about this yesterday. When we receive the Holy Spirit, He is our guarantee for our inheritance. Somebody turn to Ephesians 1, just one person, turn to Ephesians 1 and read verse 13 and 14 out loud. He's got Kyle, go for it. gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Okay, so the Spirit, upon belief, we receive the Spirit, like we talked about yesterday morning, and when you receive the Spirit, he is your guarantee of your inheritance awaiting you in heaven. And so, just as Samuel went from a orphan who owned nothing, he literally wore the same clothes every day. We, we showed up every day. He had the same sweater on, the same pants on, and he reeked of urine and everything else. He had no clothes, though. And then when we, when we uh, took him home, uh, when we actually drove him away from the, from the orphanage, uh, we had to bring clothes. We had to clothe him with our clothes because the, the clothes that he had been wearing every day stayed with the orphanages. He owned nothing. He had no inheritance. To suddenly, through one legal transaction, one set of papers that we signed, one transaction that happened, he passes from one who owns nothing to now he's a Norris and everything that's ours is his. And one day when I die and go be with Jesus, I have a will, and my will uh, imparts to him as my son everything that's mine. And this is true spiritually for us as well. That we move from one who has nothing and is an enemy of God to one who owns everything that is God's. Think about this. What was Samuel's inheritance versus what is it now? But even more significantly, what was our inheritance before Christ? And what is it now? Your inheritance before Jesus ransomed you was hell. Eternal condemnation and separation from God because of your sin. Your inheritance now through Christ is full acceptance, declared holy and righteous, and eternal bliss with him forever in heaven. Listen to this. Speaking of heaven, what exactly is our inheritance? There's so many ways that we can answer this. We get fellowship with, with God. We get intimacy with God. Uh, we get the blessings of God in terms of all that comes with knowing him. But uh, I love this quote from John Piper, from the book, God is the Gospel. He says this, speaking specifically of our inheritance in heaven. He says this, if you could have heaven with no sickness and with all the friends you ever had on earth and all the food you ever liked and all the leisure activities you've ever enjoyed and all the natural beauties you ever saw and all the physical pleasures that you've ever tasted and no human conflict, no natural disasters, no sickness. Could you be satisfied in heaven? Pause. If Christ were not there. See, the whole point of everything, the whole point of this is Jesus. It's what I said earlier. It's not that we get things from him. It's that we get him. God has rescued you and transferred you from an orphan to a son and daughter, not just for the sake of that you get all kinds of really good things. It's that you get Jesus, He, more than anything else, is our inheritance. The whole point of heaven is God. The triune God. God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit. And at that time, when we're all there together, gathered as saints, the whole point is going to be that every person who's ever existed on heaven, in heaven and in hell, is going to bow and declare that Jesus is God. The whole point is Christ. 
He is our inheritance, and the blank underneath that is this is the privilege that the gospel offers. This is the privilege that the gospel offers. Lastly, our adoption. Fourth, our adoption in Christ gives us a new image and a new name. Paul uses the term in Christ over 100 times in the New Testament. It's actually the most common phrase used to describe Christians, that we are in Christ. And in a sense, that's our new name. We are now image bearers, not just of God in general, but we are being made more and more each day into the image of Christ. The fact that we are in Christ is more than just a label. It's an identity. We have a new identity, and that's your blank underneath there. This is the identity that the gospel offers. This is the identity that the gospel offers. We are new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, uh, For if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. So we're made new in Christ. One of the things I want you to get and understand is this. Being new creations in Christ, I want you to remember this, this was true of an orphan. So Samuel leaves, like I said a second ago, Samuel leaves the orphanage and he has nothing. He has no clothes. He's literally naked until we clothe him. Spiritually speaking, this is true of us. We, we are clothed before Christ. We are clothed in our sin. That's what defines us. But God, through Christ and upon faith in Him, clothes us in His righteousness. So here's the picture I want you to get. Colossians 3 says this. Verse 3 says, For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So here's what I want you to do. Uh, Curtis, stand up. That's what you get when you sit on the front row. Yeah. 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 All right, so I want you to just stick your fist up like this, okay? All right, so this fist right here represents Curtis. This is Curtis before Jesus. And when you look at Curtis, what do you see? You see Curtis, right? You see Curtis in all of his sin. You see Curtis in all of his faults and whatever. And this is not a knock on Curtis. It's true of all of us. And so imagine that my eyes are the eyes of God. What Colossians 3, 3 tells me is this. That for you have died, not physically, but spiritually, you have died to yourself, and your life is now hidden. So I'm going to take this hand here, and imagine this is the hand of Christ. This is Christ covering Curtis. And so Curtis is now hidden in Christ. For you have died, and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. And so no longer are you clothed in your sin, according to what God sees, but now you're clothed and covered and hidden in Christ. And where when God sees you, He sees Jesus. Curtis is hidden in Christ. So if my eyes are the eyes of God, when I look at Curtis, where's Curtis? He's in there, right? He hasn't disappeared, but when he looks at you, he sees the clothing of righteousness of Jesus. To where even though Curtis is still struggling with sin at times, and, and this sanctification process, when God looks at you, he sees the finished work of Jesus and you're declared righteous. Okay, thanks, bud. Um, you have a new identity. You're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. You've been given a new name, just as we changed Samuel's name from Doodle to Mitchell Mikhailovich to Samuel Gibbs Norris. You've been given a new name from one of enemy to one of son or daughter. Look at verses 8 through 11. In closing. It says this, formerly when you do not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years, I'm afraid that I have labored over you in vain. Here's the question that Paul's asking, and you guys don't miss this, this is huge. If you begin to understand what God has done for you in the gospel through Jesus, taking you from an orphan and an enemy to a son who is adored and the recipient of all things that are of God, how in the world would you go back and live in your old life? Better question, why in the world would you do that? Think about this. What if Samuel came to me today and said, Dad, I've been with you for nine years now. Uh, it's been pretty good. But you know, I was thinking, I really want to go back and live in the orphanage. It would be completely illogical and just crazy for him to say that. He would never do that. He would never say, you've, you've 
You bestowed everything I've ever longed for on me. You're my dad who has loved me. You're my mom who has loved me. Rachel's the most amazing mother I could ever imagine to him and to our other children. And you have done this amazing thing for me. And yet, God, uh, I really, or Dad, I really just want to go back to the orphanage and not have anything and, and be away from you guys. I mean, it would just be asinine for him to say that. Yet what we do often in our hearts, what we do often in our lives, is that we look at what God has done for us, and we say, you know, I'd rather be an orphan. I'd rather live as though these things aren't true, true of me. So, guys, I want you to be gripped by the gospel this morning in such a way, through this gospel uh, uh, metaphor of, uh, of adoption, that you would go, yeah, this is crazy to not live for God who has done such a thing for me. To not be in awe of his mercy. To not be compelled to obedience because of his grace in my life. And to obey God and to love him as we talk about him gracefully. Let me read you this quote from Dan Kruger. I think every Christian, and I know you guys aren't there yet, but one day when you guys are married, I think every Christian should at least pray about God that you have to adopt. And he's not going to call everyone to adopt. But I think every Christian should consider it. Not just because it's such a visual representation of what he's done for us spiritually, but because it's an unbelievable need in this world. Most recent statistics are that 143 million orphans exist in the world today. Every 18 seconds, another child in the world is orphaned. What's happening in Syria and Iraq alone right now is, is just one of the most gut-wrenching, heartbreaking things I've ever, ever read. I read an article yesterday that I wish I could read to you right now about how ISIS is going through parts of Syria and Iraq and just mowing down all the adults. I can't, it's hard for me to even say this. What they're doing is they're taking girls from the ages of one to nine who they killed their parents who are now orphans and they're selling them into sex slavery to uh, these other men within ISIS. There's one story that I read, and I know this is really hard to hear, there's one story that I read of a nine-year-old girl who has been raped by 20 different men. And she goes after each time that she's given to a different man, they send her back into uh, surgery to be made a virgin again, only to be raped and lose her virginity again. Over and over and over again. Unbelievable evil. Unbelievable. There are things happening in this world while we sit in nice little cushy America. And the North American church has got to wake up. I mean, we've got to wake up. Most oftentimes, what you desire more than anything else is to have a great little worship experience. When people are, when, when we've got kids all over the world that are orphaned and being raped. And we stand by complaining because we didn't get what we wanted on social media or whatever it is. we got to wake up, people. The gospel propels us not just to be in awe of what God has done for us individually, but the gospel propels us to bring change in significant ways to the broken world around us. And one of the ways that we can do that is to give towards orphan care financially and prayerfully, and then when we are able to actually bring some of these children who are so damaged by evil into the homes of those who will bring them into the care of Christ. So that we can actually rescue them physically and then by God's grace rescue them spiritually. Let's pray. Father, thanks for this time together. And Lord, we pray that you would so compel us with your gospel that we wouldn't be Orders of your grace. God, it's just unbelievable, and I'm just confessing my own sin here. It's just really, really sickening my own heart of oftentimes what I, um, what I get bent out of shape about. And the ways in which I take your grace that has been so abundant to me, and I actually have the audacity to shake my fist at you when my first world problems don't work out the way I want them to. When in various places in this world today, uh, there are children who don't have mommies and daddies, who don't have homes, and who are being 
held captive by evil men and used for sexual pleasure. God, break our hearts over the evil in this world and help us to remember that we are the ones that have hope. We have the hope for the world in this Jesus. We have it. And yet, we often sit on it and act like it means nothing to us. We're not moved by your grace. We're not compelled by your love. We're not controlled by your spirit. Too often, we're just really selfish people. And so God, 